അഹമ്മദീലീനീനീനീനീനീനീനീനീനീനീനീനീനീനീനീനീനീനീനീനീനീനീനീനീനീനീനീനീനീനീനീനീനീനീനീനീനീനീനീനീനീനീനീനീന
Allah Akbar Allah Akbar السلام عليكم ورحمة الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله الله استغفر الله استغفر الله اللهم لا معني لما أعطيت ولا معطي سلام عليك السلام حيلا برحمتك يا رحمة الله <تصفيق> شفنا عنك غطاء فوق سنة الله لا إله إلا
الحمد لله الحمد لله وكفى وسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى ما بعد قال الله تعالى في القرآن المجيد والفرقان الحميد بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لقد نسركم الله في مواطن كثيرة ويوم حنين إذ أعجبتكم كثرتكم فلم تغني عنكم شيئا وضاقت عليكم الأرض بما رحبت ثم وليتم مدبرين ثم أنزل الله سكينته على رسوله وعلى المؤمنين وأنزل جنودا لم تروها وعذب الذين كفروا وذلك جزاء الكافرين سرق الله العظيم سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم افتح علينا حكمتك وانشر علينا رحمتك يا ذا الجلال والإكرام اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما يا رب صل وسلم دائما أبدا على حبيبك خير الخلق كلهم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي اللهم صل على محمد كلما ذكره الذاكرون وصل على محمد كلما غفر عن ذكره الغافلون Honorable العلماء Brothers and sisters listening Alhamdulillah Only through the fuzzle of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala today We've reached the 50th session of doing the seerah of Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We started the seerah session when lockdown initially started. And alhamdulillah, only through the fuzzle of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we managed to reach this stage of 50th session. Whenever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us a ni'mah, we should always thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. By thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make sure that Inshallah, the seerah will be completed. Inshallah. So for the last couple of weeks, we've been talking regarding the conquest of Makkah al-Mukarma. And as I mentioned, the greatest event which took place in the life of Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was the conquest of Makkah al-Mukarma. Because Makkah al-Mukarma, before paganism came, Ibrahim alayhi salatu wa salam was worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Ismail alayhi salatu wasalam worshipped Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and there were no idols in Kaaba. It was an, it, it was until a person from Banu Khuza'a by the name of Amr bin Luhay, he brought the idols into Makkah al-Mukarramah, the biggest idol called Hubal. And from there, idol worshipping started in Makkah al-Mukarramah until conquest of Makkah al-Mukarramah. So in this sense, also, this was a great event, the first time in the history the paganism was wiped off from Makkah al-Mukarramah. And as I mentioned, why was Makkah al-Mukarramah conquered? Because of a treaty which was broken by Banu Bakr and the Quraysh. Banu Bakr had a treaty with the Muslims. And they broke that treaty. So Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with 10,000 sahabas went south to Makkah al-Mukarramah. And Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam reached a place called Juhfa. And Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhu told Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that Ya Rasulullah, give me the permission to enter Makkah al-Mukarramah and explain to the people of Makkah that you will never be able to fight the Muslims. The only other option you have is surrender. So Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he goes into Makkah al-Mukarramah and he explains to the people, he explains to Abu Sufyan that the only way, the only option you have is to surrender. And I mentioned this couple of sessions back that Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam entered Makkah al-Mukarramah and there was no fighting. Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said there's amnesty to everyone. Whoever enters the house of Abu Sufyan, whoever enters the house of uh, their own houses or whoever enters Kaaba, they are all free. They are all protected. So Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the sahabas, they entered Makkah al-Mukarramah and Makkah al-Mukarramah was conquered. One of the first things which he did was he performed a tawaf after performing tawaf, as I mentioned, this was a place of idol worshipping, where the Kaaba was. And it is stated that there were 360 idols around Kaaba. So Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, with his stick, he broke all of, all of the idols. And he ordered uh, Umar radiallahu ta'ala to clean up, and also clean up inside the Kaaba. Because even inside the Kaaba, there were idols, and there were drawings of idols. Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, thereafter entered the Kaaba, he had performed two rakat, salah inside. And then the people of Makkah, they were waiting. Now what will Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam do with this? So there were 10,000 sahabas and approximately two to 4,000 residents who were waiting. Now what will Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam do? 
And as I mentioned, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gave a short sermon where he praised Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. He thereafter mentioned a few things about equality and then he said, La tathriba alaykum. That today there's no admonishment for you lot. Idhabu, you are free to go. Wa antum you are free. That 13 years of persecution, Nabi Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in one sentence forgave all of them. And Nabi Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam stayed in Mecca al Mukarma for 19 days. In them, so Nabi Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam started his journey about 10th of Ramadan. He reached Mecca at 20th of Ramadan and for about 15 to 19 days he lived in Mecca al Mukarma. There he taught the, the Sahabas about Islam. There were people who embraced Islam in multitudes. And as I mentioned last week, then Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had mentioned to the Sahabas that there's, we've got a couple of people in our list. If you find them, then you are allowed to kill them. Because of the atrocities they've done against the Muslims, if you find them in the streets, then you are allowed to kill them. So these people, these enemies, they ran away from Makkah al-Mukarmah. As I mentioned, Ikrama, he was on that list. Safwan, he was on that list. Wahshi, he was on that list. These were the people who actually tortured the Sahabas. But, as I mentioned last week, they later on became Muslim. Ikrama, as I mentioned last week, he became Muslim. He actually went to Abyssinia. There, he, he, he was about to get drowned. The whole ship was about to get drowned. And he said, that, Oh Allah, if you protect me, then I will go and become Muslim. So Ikrama, he became Muslim. Safwan, the son of Umayyah bin Khalf. Umayyah bin Khalf, the one who used to lay Bilal radiallahu ta'ala on the floor. He went a step further. He said that I'm going to kill myself. I'm going to go somewhere far. It wasn't until Urwa, his best friend, he went to Prophet and said, Oh Prophet my friend Safwan, the son of Umayyah, he is about to kill himself. Will you protect him? Or will, if I give him protection, will you leave him? And the Sahaba leave him. Prophet said, We will leave him. We won't do anything if he has been granted protection. So he said to Prophet but if I go and see him, he won't believe me. So this is when Prophet gave him a tur- his turban. That look, this is my turban as a proof that you've actually spoken to me. And Safwan, Urwa met Safwan, and Safwan was brought to Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa invited him towards Islam. He said, give me two months. After two months, I'll think about whether I should embrace Islam or not. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, you want two months, I'll give you four months. Think about this religion of Islam. And if you want to embrace Islam, you've got four months. We'll give you four months. Muhlet. So he was given four months. And there were others, Wahshi, who left. So these were the arch enemies who left Makkah al-Mukarrama, but they embraced Islam. In, as I mentioned last week, one of the other person who embraced Islam here was the father of Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala, Abu Quhafa. As Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala, who brought Abu Quhafa. He was one of the eldest people living in Makkah al-Mukarrama. One of the... As Abu Bakr bought him in the presence of Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, you should have bought your father. He's an elderly person. We should have gone to him. And I mentioned last week, this shows the etiquette that we should be going towards the elders, not elders coming to us. And Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa on the hands of Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Abu Quhafa embraced Islam. And this is where Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala started crying. And he said to Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa only if these hands were the hands of Abu Talib, it would have been such a happy and it's such a joyous, joyous day for us. One of the things about Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala an, this is a, a point to know is Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala an, four generations of his were sahabas. His father was a sahabi because Abu Quhafa. Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala an, he was a sahabi. His uh, daughters and his sons were sahabas and Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala an, his grandchildren they saw Prophet So four generations of Abu Bakr were Sahabas. So Abu, so Abu Quhafa embraced Islam. And things were running smoothly in Makkah al-Mukarramah. And as I mentioned, this was one of the greatest conquests of Makkah al-Mukarramah. To such an extent, the scholars have mentioned that a Quranic surah was revealed here to show to Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa how great this conquest was. Conquest in Arabic means fath. And a surah was revealed. Which surah? Surah An-Nasr. إِذَا جَاءَ نَسْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحِ 
ورأيت الناس يدخلون في دين الله أفواجا فسبح بحمد ربك واستغفر إنه كان توابا The translation is that إذا جاء نسر الله that when the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes والفتح and conquest ورأيت الناس يدخلون في دين الله أفواجا and you see people entering Islam in multitude then فسبح glorify Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala واستغفر and seek repentance استغفار do استغفار of Allah subhanahu from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala إنه كان توابا he is the 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 acceptant the, the acceptor of uh, forgiveness when this surah was revealed when this surah was revealed sahabas were really happy because this surah showed that now people will be entering Islam ورأيت الناس يدخلون that because of this foot people will be entering Islam but there were a couple of sahabas who started crying one of them was Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala it is stated the sahabas asked the oh Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala why are you crying this is a such a uh, such a surah which is giving glad tidings to us that people will be entering Islam Hazrat Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala said you do not understand what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is trying to portray in this surah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is trying to say that oh Nabiya Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam your mission is coming to an end your mission is coming to an end. And when a prophet's mission comes to an end, that's the time in them years they are lifted. They are taken away from this world. Because that's what prophet comes in this world for, to do their mission. After they've done their mission. And and how did I deduce this? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَسَبِّحْ بِحَمْدِ Rabbik وَاسْتَغْفِرْ That glorify Allah and do istighfar. Because istighfar is usually and always done after we end something. So, for example, after we finish our salah, okay, it comes in hadith, that we should read istighfar. Those people who go for gush in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, calling people towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the streets, okay? When the Amir Sahib says, the gush is finished, let's go back to masjid. What does the Amir Sahib normally says? Everyone, now do your istighfar. Why? Because the amal of gush has come to an end now. Scholars have mentioned the wisdom why we say istighfar at the end of all actions is because we were not able to do that action as prescribed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, those, that deficiency which was left in the amal, oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. So Zabu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu said, this is what this surah is trying to imply. That your mission is coming to an end. Now glorify Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and do istighfar. So this surah was revealed at this time as well. Now Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam lived in Makkah al-Mukarma throughout the Ramadan. And then the month of Shawwal came. And then something was brewing, something was happening in the nearby city. Okay, A city which is called Taif, where Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went, if you remember when Prophet reached the age of 50. Taif, many people think is very close. Because when they read their stories, Makkah to Taif, but it's actually really far. It's about 70 miles away from Makkah to Mukarramah, Taif. Those who have been to Taif, it's actually on a, on a mountain. So if anyone visits Taif, they have to go through a mountainous area. In Taif lived the second largest uh, Arabian tribe called Banu Thaqif. The largest Arabian tribe are the Quraysh. They lived in Mecca. And the second were Banu Thaqif. They lived in Taif. And they always had enmity and rivalry between Taif and Mecca because of this. Because they had Thaqif, they had Quraysh. In Mecca, they had Hubal as the biggest idol. In Taif, they had uh, Lat. You know, Allah SWT talks about Lat, Womanat, and Lat in the Quran. So they always had rivalry. And as I mentioned, the Abraha, when he actually came to destroy Kaaba, he actually entered Taif. And it was the people of Taif, one of the person in Taif, who actually showed Abraha where Kaaba was. So they always had rivalry. So what they thought that the next place where Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will come to attack will be Taif, will be us. Because paganism has been destroyed for Mecca. The second place where paganism was, was in Taif. So they thought Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with his army will come and destroy us. So they started getting their armies ready. So they got their army ready and what they did was those, those tribe who lived between Taif and Makkah, they call the, the Qabila Hawazin. 
They lived between Ta'if and Mecca. They got them ready as well. And they managed to gather approximately 20,000 people. And they had a newly elected commander, a very young warrior by the name of Malik bin Auf. It was probably his, one of his first battles. So he said to his army, 20,000, that in this army, we're going to, I'm going to, we're going to attack Makkah al mukarramah but we're going to use a different strategy. And the strategy which he chose was, that usually when people go to attack, only men goes, and a couple of women. In this army, I want all the men going as well, so 20,000 men. I want all their wives going. I want all their children going. I want all their animals going. And I want all their wealth. Everything. In this army, we're going to take everything. Everyone needs to take their wives, their children, their wealth, their animal, everything. Now because he was the Amir, the leader of this huge army, everyone had to listen. So they traveled from Taif, 20,000. Now there was a commander in that army called Duraid. He was a blind commander. As he was walking, he heard all these commotion, noise. So he went to ask someone, that how come there's so much noise coming? There's animal noise, there's wife, children noise, sound. They said, haven't you heard? Because he was blind, so he didn't know. Haven't you heard the order of Malik bin Auf that we have to take everyone? So Duraid said, Duraid was an elderly commander, an old man. He told that person, take me to Malik bin Auf. This is wrong what he's doing. So he went to Malik bin Auf. And he said, oh Malik bin Auf, what's this I've heard? That you've told everyone to take their children, their wife, their wealth, their money, everything. What's this? Malik bin Auf said, yes, because if, if they take everything, then they will fight harder. They've got a lot to lose. So that's why I'm telling them to take everything. And the stake will be high. So Duray said, don't do that. Tell them to leave. Because if we lose this battle, then all this will become a booty for them. And secondly, when you're in a battle, then no one thinks about their wives. No one thinks about their wealth. Everyone's worrying about their own life. So you don't need all these, their wives and their children to come with us. But Malik bin Auf said, no, I don't want to listen to you. And he actually got really angry at Duraid. And scholars here mention a very worthy point that this clash of old versus young has always been there. Because Malik was young, very young. And Duraid was a very elderly person. He actually became blind. And even at that time, it was a clash between a young man and an elderly person. Scholars here mention, whilst I was reading this, that this has been happening throughout stages, where young and man, well, young and elderly people they can't sometimes get together. Young, young breed they say that we should do this. The elderly they say no, we should we should do this. And then the elderly people they complain that these people they don't listen to us. And then the young people they say, but these elderly they they're not that advanced. Why should we listen to them? So scholars have mentioned that we should always respect our elders. Because young people will have knowledge. They will have knowledge. But elders, they have something which usually young people don't have. And that is experience. This is why there's a very profound proverb in Arabic. لَيْسَ الْعِلْمُ كَالْتَجْرُبَةِ There's no knowledge better than experience. You put knowledge on one side and you put experience on the other side. Experience will outweigh knowledge. This is why you will see. For example, if you call someone to do our extension and a young person comes and he shows us all his qualification, that I'm ready to do your extension. I'll charge you 50,000 pounds. These are all my latest qualification. But I can tell you this much, I've never done an extension. But I can say, say this to you, that I've got all this knowledge and I've studied in college for this many years. And then another person comes, a 50, 60 years old person. And he says, look, I'm an old man. I've got old qualification. But I've been doing extension for the last 10, 20 years. I can do extension with my eyes closed. Who will we choose? We'll choose the experienced person. 
Because when a person experiences something, then it teaches him something. It teaches him something. And that lesson which a person learns from experience is better than knowledge. This is why we see in, in history as well, that whenever an elderly person gives mushura, we should listen to them. Because they, they sometimes say something which other people don't understand. And they sometimes, uh, sometimes talk outside the box because they've experienced something. I was listening to the story of Baqi ibn Bakhlid. Baqi ibn, Bak- Bak- Baqi ibn Bakhlid. A young sahabi, uh, sorry, a young student, 20 years old. From Andalus, from Spain, he traveled all the way to Baghdad to study ilm, to study knowledge. From Spain to Baghdad, it's about three and a half thousand miles. Baqi, he reached Baghdad and he went in one of the masjids and he sat in the dars and he asked, now who is this person giving dars? Someone said, it's Yahya ibn Ma'in. Rahmatullahi alayhi. So after the dars was finished, Baqi went to him and t- spoke to him. That I've come, I've traveled from Andalus, Spain, and I've come here to learn knowledge. And he started talking about Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal. So Yahya ibn Ma'in said, you're talking about Imam, Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal? Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal is the father of all the muhaddith, of all the teachers. But Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal He's an old man. He's an old person. And he has been put into house arrest. The governor of Baghdad has put him into house arrest because of one masla, because of one ruling, which he is not agreeing with. It is, all our, it is our aqidah that Quran is not a creation. Quran is not a creation. Because how can something which Allah uttered be a creation? So at that time, Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal said to the governor the Quran cannot be a creation and because of him saying this he was put into house arrest so Baqi ibn Bakhlid he went to Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal's house and this is what we wanted to say he knocked on his door and Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal he was about 60 years old now he opened in the door and he said who are you? so Baqi said I am Baqi where have you come from? he said I've come from a very far place have you come from Africa? Imam Ahmad said Baqi ibn Bakhlid said, no, no. Even further away from Africa. I've come from Spain, Andalus. So he said, you've come from Andalus to learn knowledge? He said, yeah. And Ahmed, Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal at that time said, but don't you know I'm in a house arrest? I am not able to teach. I'm not able to share any hadith with you. Baqi, a young companion, a young student, he said, but I've come. I've traveled three and a half thousand miles. And this is when Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal came up with a plan. This is what I wanted to say. Now look at the plan which Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal said to Baqi. Oh Baqi, that what you do is you change your clothing into a beggar clothing. Okay? As if you're a beggar. And come in the streets, in the street as a beggar. Okay? And say, Al-Ajr, Al-Ajr, meaning I want reward, I want reward, I want food. And then knock on people's door. And when you come to my door, okay, I will open the door, okay, I will give you a piece of bread, and I will teach you one hadith. And this is how Baqi ibn Makhlid, he became a muhadith. And he learned so many hadith from Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal like this. Every day he would come, and he would knock on the door, ask for a bread, and whilst taking that bread, he would learn one hadith from Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal. So we should always respect our elders, Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as I mentioned, where, when Abu Quhafa came, Prophet sallallahu said to Hazrat Abu Bakr, what did he say? Yarham sagheerana, wa lam ya'rif haqqa kabirina. That whoever does not show mercy to our young ones, wa haqqa kabirina, wa lam ya'rif haqqa kabirina, and does not honor our elders, falaysa minna, he's not from us. So as I was mentioning, Malik bin Awf didn't listen to Duraid. And they kept on traveling until they reached a place near Hunayn. Okay? And what they did was they, they were now Taif is on a mountainous area. So they were expert in archers. So what they did was they on either side of the valley they hid okay, and they put a, gro- a, a group in the middle. So when the Sahabas would come through that valley 
they would attack from both sides of the valley. That, that's, that was their tactic. So that's what they did. Now here, Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam found out on 6th of Shawwal that Taif, the people of Taif, have actually prepared an army of 20,000 people to come to attack us. So Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told the sahabas, the old sahabas, get ready, we are going. And this was one of the first battles when Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam also took non-Muslims as well. So 10,000 sahabas went because they came from Makkah, Medina. And 2,000 people from Makkah al Mukarrama came who embraced Islam, new converts. And in the new converts, Prophet sallallahu also took non-Muslims. And Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked Safwan. If you remember, Safwan has not embraced Islam. He's asked for two months delay. Prophet sallallahu went to Safwan and said to Safwan, Oh Safwan, you're still a non-Muslim? But can we borrow armor from you? So Safwan said, do you want to take the armor or do you want it as, to borrow as a loan? Prophet Sassam said, I'm only asking to loan. We will give them armor back. So Safwan gave 100 armor to Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And Prophet Sassam distributed to the Sahabas. And Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with 12,000 Sahabas went. They reached, as they were going, okay, this was the first time in history where the, the Sahabas were this many. In Badr, they were 313. In Uhad, they were 1,000. Then 700. In, uh, in the Battle of Mu'atah, there were 3,000. So this was the first time there were 12,000. So some of the Sahabas, they started saying that today we're, we've got numbers. Before, we've never had numbers. But today, we've got numbers. And because we've got numbers, we're going to win this battle. And Nabi Karim Sallallahu said, don't say that. They went, they reached a place called Hunayn. And that's where as they were, so Khalid bin Walid, he was actually leading the army. Behind him was Zubair, radiallahu ta'ala. Behind him was the army of Ali, radiallahu ta'ala. Khalid bin Walid, he was at the front. Okay? As they went through the valley okay, to attack the army, the, the, the people who were waiting on the, on, on the valley, on the, on the mountain, they started showering the archers and the arrows. When they started doing this, Khalid bin Walid and his army didn't know what to do. So they went back. Now when they went back, there was a clash. Because they're coming back and the Muslims are coming forward. And this is where the whole turmoil happened. And this is what Quran says, that you should never be pride, you should never be proud of your numbers. Because help will only come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam shouted, the Anna Nabi la kadib. Because everyone was looking for Nabi Karim Sassim, that he will guide us. Prophet Sassim from the corner was shouting, Anna Nabi la kadib, Anna ibn Abdul Muttalib, that I am a prophet, I am not a liar, I am the grandson of Abdul Muttalib. And he was saying this so that people would regroup, or people would see where Prophet Sassim and would come there. Abbas had the reign of uh, the, the mule on, on which Prophet Sassim was sat on. Prophet Sassim said to Abbas, Oh Abbas, you shout. And Abbas radiallahu ta'ala who shouted, and approximately 90 to 100 sahabas, they actually came, they saw Prophet and they came to Prophet And Prophet said, come on, let's march forward. And this is what Quran says, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at that time revealed angels. So in Badr, angels came and here, angels came. And angels came and the, the, the mushrikeen who were on the opposite side, when they saw the numbers, because they never knew these were angels, they retreated. They thought, we can't fight this many people. And they retreated. Some of them went to Awtas, and a lot of them went to back to their own place, Taif. And they left, as what Duraid said, they left all their booty there. What was the booty? 6,000 prisoners, 24,000 camels, 40,000 goats, and 6,000 ounce, six, sorry, 3,000 ounce of silver they left in the Battle of Hunayn. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to the Sahabas, O oh, Sahabas, take all this to Ja'irana. We will meet you in Ja'irana. Let us go behind them in Ta'if. So Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went to Ta'if to attack them. But because Ta'if was fortified, the Sahabas couldn't attack the people of Ta'if. Because every time the Sahabas would go forward to attack Ta'if, okay, they would send their arrows. So like this, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Sahabas, they stayed outside Taif for about 10 days and they could not attack. I mean, they couldn't penetrate inside Taif. 
So one of the days, Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa said to the sahabas, Oh sahabas, tomorrow we're going back to Makkah al-Mukarramah. So one of the sahaba, I think it was Umar radiallahu ta'ala, who went to Prophet Oh Prophet just curse them. If you curse them, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will finish them. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was rahmatul alameen. He lifted his hand and he made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Oh Allah, Allahumma hadi thaqifan, Oh Allah, give hidayah to the people of thaqif. Oh Allah, give hidayah to the people of Taif. And then the next day, Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa and the sahabas, they left that place. And they did not conquer Taif. And they did not penetrate inside Taif. Now they're coming back to Ji'irana. So Ji'irana is one of the miqats. So Ji'irana is about 40 miles away from Makkah al-Mukarramah. So Prophet Muhammad has already told the sahabas that leave all the booty there. Take it there and we'll come. So Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa and the sahabas, they're going from outskirts of Taif to Ji'irana. And they camp at a place. It's the time of Salah. So everyone is gathered there. They sat down. And Hazrat Bilal radiallahu ta'ala gives azan. When Bilal radiallahu ta'ala gives azan, okay, it's pin drop silence. Everyone is quiet. And people can hear that there's a, a group of youngsters who are mocking the azan of Bilal radiallahu ta'ala. And people can hear this. That Hazrat Bilal radiallahu ta'ala is giving azan and there's a couple of people who are mocking the azan of Bilal radiallahu ta'ala. The azan is finished. Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam calls Hazrat Ali and Hazrat Zubair. They go and call them youngsters here. Those youngsters are brought in front of Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asks, now were you the ones who were mocking the azan of Bilal radiallahu ta'ala? Obviously, they couldn't deny. They said, yeah. In one narration, Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, who was it? Who was the person who had the highest noise or who had the highest sound? So Abu Mahadura, he came forward. He said he was me. And he came in the presence of Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he did not know Okay, there's, just imagine 12,000 army there. Okay, and you've been caught red-handed. And you're in front of Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And you don't know what's going to happen now. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asks Abu Mahzura, were you the one who was giving the azan the loudest? Meaning mocking the azan the loudest? He, he replied, yes. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, that shall I not teach you the words of azan? And then Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam invited him towards Islam. And Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he stroked, because he was still a youngster, Prophet stroked the, the, the forehead of Abu Mahdura. And Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Shall I not teach you the words of Hassan? Abu Mahdura said, These words melted my heart. And I embraced Islam. He was a non-Muslim. He embraced Islam. And he said, Okay, Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa so Prophet then read the azan. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. And Abu Mahdura repeated, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Now because he was really scared, he repeated the words really slow. So Prophet said, repeat it again. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Okay, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah. So Abu Mahdura said, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah. Prophet said, meaning say it loudly, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah. So Abu Mahdura is saying each word four times. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah 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 Ashhadu anna Muhammadan rasulullah Ashhadu anna Allah this he completed his azan Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam he after he after Prophet sallam teaching him the azan it is stated that Abu Mahdura then asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam can I be the muaddin of Makkah al-Mukarramah and Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam gave him that honor and he became the muaddin of Makkah al-Mukarramah it is stated that every, he, he died at the age of 99. Every day he would go into Makkah al-Mukarramah, he would perform wuzu, he would make dawah, and he would make azan. And this is how Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to win hearts. That a minute ago he's mocking the azan, and now he's become the muaddin of Makkah al-Mukarramah. Scholars mention that f- from then, for the next 300 years, all those people who were the muaddin in Makkah al-Mukarramah came from the family of Abu Mahdura. Such was the love which Abu Mahdura had that someone once asked him, Oh Abu Mahdura, how come you don't shave 
the, the, the head which was in your, near your forehead. He said, that hair which was touched by Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will never shave. This is how Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to bin hands. So this is an incident which happened here. Then Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the sahabas, they went to Jairana. And that's where all the booty were. Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, that we are not going to distribute the booties now. We're going to wait 10 days. If the people of Thaqif, if the people of Hawazin, if they come and they ask for their booty, we will give them back. We don't want them. So they waited 10 days. But none of the people of Qabila Hawazin, they came to ask for their booty. So after 10 days, Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa said, okay then, now we can distribute. So Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he distributed all this wealth which he had to the Sahabas. And majority of everything went to the people of Makkah. Abu Sufyan, sorry, Safwan. If you remember, Safwan is the one who, who was asked for two months. Uh, uh, two, uh, two months. Then Nabi Akadim Sallallahu Alaihi told him that I'll give you four months. Prophet Sallallahu Prophet Sallallahu Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi borrowed hundred armor from Safwan. Prophet Sallallahu called Safwan and he gave him hundred camels. And this changed the heart of Safwan. And this is when uh, Safwan embraced Islam. When Nabi Karim Sallallahu gave him hundred camels, he embraced Islam. So forget four months. Within few weeks, Safwan became Muslim. And this was when Nabi Karim Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gave a lot of booty to the non-Muslims. Uh, there's, a, there's a category called Mu'allafat Qulub. Mu'allafat Qulub, okay, those people where, who you give zakah to, you give money to, so that they embrace Islam. And a lot of the non-Muslims, they got booty. A lot of the leaders of Makkah al-Mukarramah, they got a lot of booty. But the Ansar, they never got anything. If you remember, 4,000 Ansar have come. They never got anything. And they started talking to each other. Now what's this? We fought with Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam all these battles. And we've got, Nabi Karim has given us nothing from this booty. Could you imagine? 24,000 camels, 40,000 goats, all this silver. And nothing has gone to Ansar. Everything is being distributed to the Meccan people. So they start talking to each other, the Ansar, that this distribution is not fair, this is not good. We've done so much for Prophet and now he's not giving us anything. So Sa'ad, who was a leader, he came to Prophet and said to Prophet, oh Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, a lot of Ansar are complaining that you've given all this to the people of Makkah. You've given nothing to the people of Ansar. And it's the people of Ansar who've helped you. Because the people of Ansar are the people of Medina, Munawwara. So Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa asked uh, Sa'ad, that what do you say? He said, he, meaning he agreed on what the people of Ansar were saying. So Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said to Sa'ad, Oh Sa'ad, at this location, I want all the Ansar to be there, present. I want to give them, I want to talk to them. So Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala, he gathered all the Sahabas, all the Ansar Sahabas, 4,000 in one area. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came and he said to the Sahabas that in this area, I don't want anyone except for Ansar because I'm going to talk to only to those people who are the Ansar. So all those people who are not Ansar, they left. And only the Ansar people are there now. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam then said that I have heard that you, are, you lot are angry at me because I've distributed all this booty to all the other people and I've not given anything to you lot. And they all reply in the affirmative because that's what happened. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, but don't you understand, O people of Ansar, meaning the people of Medina, that you were astray, you were uh, uh, misguided and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through me guided you. You were poor. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through me gave you wealth. You were, you were fighting between each other. And when I came, okay, brotherhood came within you. Did I do all this to, for you? So Ansar, they reply, yes. Meaning, because of you, O Muhammad Sassam, this has happened. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam then after then said, then what are you going to reply? Are you, have you got anything to say? O people of Ansar. So they said, Meaning, what can we say? 
I mean, how can they reply to Prophet ﷺ? Prophet ﷺ said to the Ansar, the O Ansar, if you wanted, if you wanted, you could have replied. I'm asking you to reply. You're not replying. But you could have replied. You could have said to me, the O Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa you were expelled. We give you shelter. You were thrown away. We give you a place to live. You could have said all this. And if you said this, you were right to say this. Then Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said something to them, which melted the heart. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, The O Ansar, Ala tardawn, Ala tardawn ya ma'ashir al-Ansar, Ay yadhab al-Nas bishati wal-ba'ir. The O people of Ansar, Are you not happy? Are you not happy? That these people who, have, who I have given booty to, wealth, animals, they're going home with animals. They're going home with wealth. Okay? أَنْ يَذْهَبَ النَّاسِ بِالشَّاتِ وَالْبَعِيرِ أَلَا تَرَضُونَ يَا مَعَشِ الْأَنْسَارِ أَنْ يَذْهَبَ النَّاسِ بِالشَّاتِ وَالْبَعِيرِ وَتَرْجِعُوا بِرَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمِ إِلَى رِحَالِكُمْ And you, O oh Ansar, when you will be going back to Medina, you are going to take your Nabi with you. These people, they're going to go home. They're going to go to Mecca, Mukarma, And they're going to take the booty which I've given them, the animals, the wealth. Are you not happy? That you're going to go home, they're going to take their animals, and you're going to go home, and you're going to take your Nabi with you. Are you not happy with this? That I am coming with you to Medina to Munawwara? And then he said, فَوَالَّذِي نَفْسُ مُحَمَّدْ بِيَدِهِ That I swear in his hand, my life is. And he said these words, That لَوْ سَلَكَ, لو سلك, لو سلك النَّاسُ شِعْبًا وَسَلَكَتِ الْأَنْسَارُ شِعْبًا لَسَلَكْتُ الْأَنْسَارُ that if the people were to travel, if the people were to, uh, were to walk towards one valley, and Ansar were to walk towards another valley, select Ansar, I would choose the valley of Ansar. If it wasn't for Hijrah, I would be an Ansar. And, oh, and he gave dua to the people of Ansar. When he finished this khutbah, when he finished saying this, the Sahabas, the Ansar, their beards were drenched with tears when they heard this coming up from the lips of Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa The old people, are you not happy? That these people are going to take animals home and you're going to take Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with you to Medina. And this is how Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam won hearts of people. Such, he had such a way of talking to people that he would melt heart. And this is where the Battle of Hunayn finishes. This was the time, and then I'll finish, when Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in one narration it is stated that he met his uh, 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 Halima Sa'adiyya radiyallahu ta'ala an, anha. This is the place. One narration states that this was the place where Prophet sallallahu met his foster mother, who fed Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when he was young. And in Ji'irana, the, the booty was uh, distributed, and this is when Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam performed Umrah from Ji'irana to Makkah al-Mukarramah. So Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in his lifetime performed four Umrah. One at the time of Hudaybiyah, but that was an Umrah because he was, they weren't let in. The second was a year after Hudaybiyah. The third was this, third Umrah. And the fourth Umrah was at the time of Hajjatul Wida. So this was, uh, so Prophet uh, performed Umrah at this time. And Alhamdulillah, we've covered uh, this year, Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, age of 61. And we've got about one, about two years left of Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Inshallah, next week, we'll be talking about the Battle of Tabuk, which took place, which was a major incident which took place when Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went to Medina al Munawwara. So as I keep on mentioning, these seerah sessions are only done so that we listen to the life of Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and we inculcate the love of Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam through our actions. We follow the lifestyle of Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and through our mouth, through our lips, we send duru sharif salutation upon Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Today is Friday, so brothers are requested and sisters alike listening at home to recite the Rushari of Abundantly upon Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. With these words, I will conclude today's session. Subhanallah, bihamdi, subhanakallahum, bihamdi, kashin, wa la ilaha illa ta, astaghfiruka wa tubu alayk.
الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاة حي على الصلاة حي على الفلا حي على الفلا قد قامت الصلاة قد قامت الصلاة الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله الله أكبر الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين لقد جاءكم رسول من أنفسكم عزيز عليه ما عنتم حريص عليكم بالمؤمنين رؤوف رحيم فإن تولوا فقل حسبي الله لا إله إلا هو عليه توكلت وهو رب العرش العظيم الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حميده الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين رب جعل لي مقيم الصلاة ومن ذريتي ربنا وتقبل دعاء ربنا اغفر لي ولوالدي وللمؤمنين يوم يقوم الحساب الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حميده الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله 
Allahu Akbar Sami Allahu liman hamidah Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar Sami Allahu liman hamida Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar السلام عليكم ورحمة الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله الله من السلام برحمتك يا